uh, anyway, take a look on page 12, I guess, of your syllabus. Uh, in that case that I gave you, black cap in, work through this thing, I hope. How, would, how do you approach it? Just cranking through this. You've got to do it quite a few times, I think, before it will just become automatic. By the way, you can use this handout if you do the quick test. Okay. No problem. Okay. So I, I was uh, using this and, and uh, having students not uh, use the uh, handout. And uh, I realized that our Richard Schrader uh, was teaching some more stuff with it, and, and he took the template that I was using for grading and gave it to all the students. And I thought, well, it might be it's okay to have the handout. But don't use the template if it's still floating around in that video. But I just threw together something real quick and dirty to grade, right? Or you plug it up and say, now coming out this for us. By the way, behind it, you do this thing on Excel. You bring your computer in or you can find a computer lab or something with a quiz. Let me do it. And for that portion of the test, the computer lab is really pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, problem. But uh, anyway, certainly it's good to do it on Excel. But don't do it camp spreadsheet where you can reflect numbers and look like that. You can't see anything about it. Okay? At, at this point, at least, obviously, real life is through the spreadsheet. Get it set up and use it. But anyway, how did you approach this thing? I'd like to know. Well, first, just, just let's go through the, what the model is. Okay, what am I doing? I'm taking, I'm get, estimating my future cash flows and I'm discounting them back to town. That's it. Isn't it? Okay, that's what this whole, that's what this model does. So we can find out what the value of each share is or what we think it is. So the formula for doing that is what? Take the estimated cash flows and divide by what? And the way to think about this is these are cash flows forever, right? So it's what I think the cash flow is going to be forever. And we can build growth into it, and we'll do that today. Okay? And we divide that by WAC. And what do we think WAC is? The interest rate, the return, right? State is the rate. The return that we should have on what? All of our assets in order to do what? Keep the shareholders happy. Keep the debt holders happy, maintain the stock price, right? Stock price will stay the same. We do exactly this, okay? And then that's what justifies the stock price, right? If you do better, the stock price goes up, theoretically. If you do worse, the stock price goes down. Make sense? Okay? All right, so it keeps everybody happy. If you divide the estimated cash flows by the WAC, what do you have? This, the cash flows are what you're earning off of your what? Assets, all your assets. I mean, all your assets are invested, right, guys? Okay. So your cash flows are what you're earning off of all the assets. The WAC is what you should earn on your assets. So there's some amount of assets here. This is going to be an estimated market value for the assets. Okay. So there's some amount of assets here that when you take it times the WAC is those cash flows. The way you can think about it, huh? Okay, you're getting these cash flows forever. So how big an investment would you have to have in assets to justify that expected cash flow given the WAC, right? So if I know these two, estimated cash flows and WAC, can I calculate the estimated market value of the assets? Yeah. So I estimate my cash flows, I estimate my WAC, right? And that will allow me to estimate the assets. So that's what the model does. Okay, so it's backing into that. Then what would you subtract from that? Because what we really want is the market value of stock, right? So you you subtract what? Estimated market value of the liabilities. And these are all my estimates here, not the market's estimates. I know the market's estimate of the market value of the stock is what the stock is selling for. All right, guys? I know that. I'm trying to get an independent one of my own. Okay, and that will equal what? Obviously, the asset plus the liabilities is the what? Estimated market value of equity. So just let this be common sense. It makes it easy. And you got to practice a few times to make sure you get this thing all out there for you. And if that's for the total equity, what if I wanted to know per share what it's worth? Divided by the yeah, divided by the shares. And so we're going to use the outstanding shares because they're the ones, obviously, the market price is based on because they're the ones that are trading. Outstanding shares. The number of outstanding shares. 
And when you do that, if you divide the estimated market value of the total equity by the number of outstanding shares, what do you get? Estimated market value of what? Per share. Does anybody have any questions at all about that? Does this seem really, really simple when I talk about it and I write it down? Does this seem really, really simple when you read? I think uh, David Collins is really a good writer. The ideas were dams and mines, kind of, that put the thing together, and then we got David involved in it, and David can make things seem really simple. I think. Right? Yeah, right. I mean, you know, I think for as complex as this model sort of is, right? When you read that case, does it just kind of make sense? What's going on? What we're trying to do? And then when we talk about it in here, too, try to get your head around it so it makes sense to you. Then you don't have to remember. By the way, you can use this uh, handout because by the time you do this, you know what the formulas are anyway. These formulas to me just are common sense. Of course, that's where I did. Okay. All right. So we've got that. So what we need is the pieces of it, huh? Would you agree? So we need to get the estimated cash flows, and we need to get the WAC, and then we're on our way. Everybody agree? And in the process of getting our uh, WAC anyway, we're going to have our estimate of the market value of the liabilities on. And we're also going to have the outstanding shares. So we're going to already have the information we need to do this. As soon as we get estimated cash flows and WAC, we're in good shape. So, all right, so let's do that. How do you do the estimated cash flows? Let's talk about how you do it. What is it really? It's all the revenues and gains you expect to continue into the future, less all the expenses and losses that you expect to continue into the future, right? For the company. Free tax. Then you're going to take it time for what? One minus the tax rates, so you get an after tax, right? And then you're going to add back non cash items. Typically, the big chunk is depreciation and amortization, right? Everything else, if you think about a cash flow statement, when you, when you convert from accrual basis income to cash flow from operations, right? Almost cash flow income, right? Cash flow basis income is not really it's close to Okay, when you do that, what's the big the big item? Depreciation typically, right? And amortization. All those other things are pretty much what? Gains and losses, and we don't want to throw those out, right? Those are in there, right? And changes in current assets and current liabilities. But those changes in current assets and current liabilities, you wouldn't expect to see here, right? Pretty much they wouldn't change, right? On an ongoing basis. So the model simplifies it, and it just makes your what? What you expect continuing income to be, right? Finance people say income from operations, but I think that's dangerous. Why do I think it's dangerous? What if you constantly have interest? What if you put your interest expense not in operating income, but down in the non operating Aren't you going to have the interest expense forever? Yeah, you got to pick up the interest expense, right? What if you always have gains and losses on selling equipment, you know, that kind of thing? Those probably ought to be picked up. What if you have reorganization costs two out of three years? You know, that's probably part of operations. Okay, so you need to think about what's really going to happen to the cash flows in the future. We're, we're in the cash flows here, right, guys? So that's, that's why it's set up the way that it is. And there's nothing wrong with the model, just make <coughs> them when you use them, okay? So for estimated cash flows, what do they do? Operating income, right? Normal operating income is the way you could think about it. So it's going to be operating income, right, that you expect to continue into the future, right? So normal taxable income, if you want to think about it that way. Times what? One minus the tax rate. rate because that's the portion you get to keep of it. Everybody agree? So what this is going to be is after-tax income, of course, right? Normal after-tax income. Plus what? Depreciation. Yeah. Depreciation and amortization. And it's expense. It's not the amount on the balance sheet. That wouldn't make any sense, right? Why do, why do we add the depreciation and amortization? It is a non-cash expense on the income statement, right, guys? We did the when we did the cash flow statement, right? It's a non-cash expense on the income statement. It doesn't use up any cash, but it reduces my income. Why don't I add it before I take it times one minus the tax rate? Because I get what's called a depreciation tax shield out of that depreciation. 
If you're in a 40% tax bracket, you have 100,000 depreciation, what happens to your taxable income? It goes down by 100,000. How many tax dollars do you save? 40,000. Everybody agree? And how much tax did you pay for the depreciation this year? None. But you got a, a, a cash savings of 40 this year. Don't feel too good about that because it is not a depreciation tax for the night. But remember, you had to buy the gas in the first place. Pay for it, right, guys? Okay, so it's just the way that it works out. It's the timing of the cash flows, right? Okay? All right, good. So that's how we get our estimated cash flows. That's not too bad, is it? What's the other piece that we need? Weighted average cost of capital. Weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so let's do that. Weighted average cost of capital. Okay, and what does that consist of? Weight of debt, what percent of your assets are financed with debt times the cost of the debt, right? Now there's one piece of it. Okay. Weight of equity times the cost of equity. Got it. Now, does this make intuitive sense to you? That the amount you must earn on your assets, which is WAC, right? The amount you need to earn on your assets to keep both debt holders and equity holders happy is the weighted average of the cost of the debt, right, times the cost of the debt times the weight of the debt, how much of your assets are financed with debt, that's the portion, that's what you have to earn, right, on those, and then the weight of the equity times what you have to earn on the equity. This makes sense, doesn't it? When you multiply these numbers together, by the way, do these numbers make any sense? Do they mean anything? No. The two added together do for wax, but you know, the weight of the debt times the cost of the debt isn't a meaningful number. It's on your way to get to the WAC, which is what we want. Okay? So, what's WAC again? Weighted average cost of capital. Threshold rate that you have to earn, right? If I'm running a company and I'm going to make an investment, I need to earn that percentage at the very least. Right? i got to make it. If I want to earn a whole bunch more than that, I'm probably increasing the risk of the business and the stuff over the lifetime. Uh, if I'm below it, I'm going to lower the dollar business. Uh, get any idea? So this is a big number. This, is, this thing really matters. Companies calculate this thing, right? And you think about it. So I won't invest in, I won't invest in anything that doesn't earn that. Now, obviously, the WAC changes if you change your debt structure, debt to equity structure, right? Or if interest rates change, or you know, if anything changes. Okay? The weights change. Okay? And and if the rates change. Okay, good. All right, guys. Where do we get this information? Where would you get your weight? Let's see those words. Weight of the death weight of the end. Get your weights first. Assets equals my liability plus my equity. Never seen this before in our life, right? Okay. Now, what you want to do is you want to take your liabilities and divide it by your assets. I like that. How would you get the equity? Percentage. Equity is a divided by assets. This is just not a big deal, right? This is going to be 100% of itself. And each of these are going to be whatever they are, assets, what I just said, huh? Okay? Assets, liabilities, and equity. Okay, now, what assets? And what liabilities? And what equity? Critical. Got it. A real common mistake. Market. Yeah, I want market on all of these. I do not care what the historical cost is on the assets. I care what they're worth. When I start a new year with a company, I am investing whatever the assets are worth in total, not at historical cost. I don't even care about the historical cost of the liabilities. It's the market, right? The market value is higher than the interest rate is lower. That's it. That's moving target, too. I really care about market. And certainly on the equity, I care about market. I don't care what the historical equity of a company is. Do you? 
Who cares if ABC stock originally for a dollar a share? They've done 10 stock splits. They are now 100 shares for every one that was issued, and now they're selling for 50 bucks each. Man, I don't want to base my earnings on that dollar that somebody got the stock for 40 years ago. That's ridiculous, right? Can't do that. Okay? So I'm investing now, so I care about markets. So get that market. Right? Now, how can I get estimates of market value? What do I use? You know, by the way, for the assets, what would I have to do? We talked about that last time. I guess appraise everything? Oh my gosh. You'd never get a very good estimate of market value. It'd take you forever. So what we do instead is we estimate the liabilities and we estimate the equity and we add the two together and that gives us our assets. Okay? Makes a lot more sense to me at least. What do we use for the liabilities? What do you want to use for the liabilities? What do I want to use for the liabilities? What do you want to use as a proxy for the market value? Got to have this guy. What do we use? Just the book value. Okay, now what happens is the book, book value of the liabilities, which is just on the balance sheet, right? We can total liabilities on the balance sheet. Okay? If you, uh, if you go get the liabilities off the balance sheet, is that really going to be their market value? Well, it'll probably be fairly close. Depends on what they're composed of. If it's all current liabilities, yes. Okay, probably pretty close, huh? There's not even any time for that, right? Okay, but what if what if they're bonds? You could get the market value if you want. You can go look it up. There's also the trade bonds. What if they're mortgages that are long term? You can look at what current interest rates are compared to the interest rates that you're paying, and you could discount those future cash flows. Just like you calculate the value of the bond, you calculate the value of the mortgage. If you think it would make a difference in your calculation, you do that. For our purposes here, okay, we're just going to use book value as a proxy for market. But remember, we're, we still think we're using market value, okay? Also, in lots of companies, if the if the stock is very valuable, the liabilities look pretty small compared to the stock. That's one thing that's interesting with this model, and some people really criticize us for that. When there's fluctuations in the, in the, in the uh, stock price, let's say the stock value goes way down, what happens? The equity goes way down. In this model, then the liabilities stay the same, pretty much. What happens if the stock price goes way up? Liabilities stay, stay the same size, but equity goes way up. But that's what's really happening, too. Okay, and that changes your wax when that happens. Okay. All right. So that we use book value as a proxy. Great. What do we want to do for equity? We have an independent measure of the market value. This is circular in terms of the mathematics, by the way. For you know, one person. Yeah, we're going to use yeah, the shares outstanding times the market value per share, but where's the circular reasoning coming here from that mathematical standpoint? We are estimating what we think the market value is, and one of the inputs we use is what the market thinks the market value is. Right? Now, uh, that's what we use in the model. Okay. All right. So, uh, you're right. We're going to use the number of outstanding shares, the same ones we were already talking about, right? The same outstanding shares. And we'll just take it times what? market value per share. And that is what the market thinks, right? The stock's worth. That's it. We're going to come up with an independent estimate of that, with our own estimate. So that's what's going on. So we want everything at market. What we'll do then is add those two together, right? So the book value of the total liabilities, right? Plus, what do we call this, by the way? When you take number of outstanding shares times market value per share, what's that called? Yep. That's market value. Market capitalization is what it stands for. Okay? Market cap. And you can find that. Okay? I'm about to find that. Okay? Everybody good? So then it's just add those two together and get your total assets and figure out what percentage each one is in the right? total asset. And you got to make. Okay? So that will give us the weights, right? Wait there, wait there. All right? What are we going to do for KD? What is It's cost of debt, and what's the main cost of the debt, of course? It's interest. So what I'm going to do here for KD is I'm going to have the interest, and I'm going to have it as an interest rate, as an interest percentage. Okay, so I'll get that, and then I take it times what? Yeah. 
And why do we do that? If you have your head, if you get your head around that, it's this is pretty easy to remember. Not even remember, it's just common sense. The interest rate is what I give the debt holders, right? That's what they are. Okay, so that's what they expect to earn. That's what we agree. Okay. Why do I take one minus the tax rate? Because I can deduct the interest on my tax return. So if I'm in a 35% tax bracket, what happens? The government pays 35% interest. That's what happens, right? Because I save that much in taxes. So if I paid $100,000 of interest, I'm in a 35% tax bracket. How much my taxes go down by? Well, my taxes go down by 35% times 100 income interest, right? 35,000. What do I end up paying? 65, right? So if I were in a 10% tax bracket and I got a 35% tax rate, what's my real what's my real cost of interest? My after tax cost of interest. 10% times one minus the tax rate, right? 25%. Everybody stay with me on this? Everything's that way, right? If you pay a, a dollar a bonus to one of your employees and you're in a 40% tax bracket, what does it cost you? 50 cents. Right, guys? Okay, that's real. Okay? What if I earn an additional dollar in revenue? It's my tax return. I'm in the 40% tax bracket. What happens? I get to keep 60 cents of it. The government takes the other 40 cents. It just happens. Okay? The way it works. Here we have to be 7% tax bracket. I wasn't very concerned about earning more. It's already worth any day of the week. So you want to work some more? <laughs> And just laugh. Yeah, what for? Pay 70 cents in taxes? Are you kidding me? Before it was sales taxes. Yeah, so, great. Okay. By the way, I did agree with lowering taxes. It's just not something that makes sense to me. That's probably what's going to do. Anyway, it's just confusing for people with word names like that. Okay, anyway. So, all right. So that's what that one's going to be. So I guess we can write anything else there. What's KE going to be? That's the only other piece, and we could calculate WAC, couldn't we? Because now we got the weights and we got the cost of the debt to do those things, right? What's KE going to be? It's the cost of the equity, but what is it? What do we use as a proxy for that? Arms. What's it called? Capital, Capital asset price and cost. Okay? So maybe we'll do that now. Okay? What's cap down? Okay. What we're saying is how much should those equity holders expect to earn given the riskiness, right, of this stock. Okay. So what we do is we say, well, what would they expect to earn if they took no risk at all? Don't you want to at least earn that? And that's going to be the risk free, right? What's that risk-free? It's a risk-free rate, right? It's still a rate, it's a percent. It's the risk-free rate, okay? And then we're going to expand that for a risk premium, huh? Because there is risk. Tell me what the risk-free rate is composed of, just conceptually. Yeah, I want to pick up expected inflation. I don't know what it's going to be, so I guess what it's going to be, and I and I want to earn at least that, right? Obviously. Also what? True return, fair return, real return, nominal return, whatever you want to call it. Okay? You'll hear all those terms. Okay? That's rent of a month. Most people think, researchers think this is 2 to 3 percent. Okay? Finance, economy, economy types. Okay? 2 to 3 percent. Okay? Over time. People want that. Okay. If you have no risk, I want that much. So, what's the, what, what are your government uh, very short term treasury bills earn right now? Even less than that, right? Okay? Even less than the two to three, so it's they're really just trying to stimulate the economy. They're paying you to paying you to borrow money from them. Okay, right? Okay. Anyways, effectively, uh, expected inflation. It's whatever it is at a particular time. What is it right now? Almost nothing, right? Maybe a couple percent. Okay. So expected inflation is whatever it is, but it's the same for everybody. Okay. And those two added together would be the risk-free. So let's say our risk-free is 5%. What does that mean? True return, 2 to 3. What do you think expected inflation must be? 2 to 3. Everybody got the idea? Okay. 
Now, what we're going to use for what are we going to use for a proxy for risk free? What do you want to use? Uh, we suggest a 30-year Treasury bond because that's the longest security the government's got. Now, why do we think U.S. government securities are risk-free? Because they'll even print the money to pay you? Pay in another country to take their money? I don't know. U.S. government pays their bills, right? It's the, the most risk-free asset there is. The U.S. government must collapse. The country must cease to exist, I guess. Or you're going to get paid. Got it? That's, that's real, okay? So it's the most secure security there is in the world. Okay? Based on the power of the country. Isn't there a policy of downgrading a couple of years back? Oh, yeah, they pretended to downgrade. Okay. So because we were going to close our government down. Yeah. That's nonsense. They went through, and so there was some risk that we weren't going to pay, but it didn't hardly affect the industry. Okay. Yeah, so they were, yeah. Typically, when you get your bonds downgraded, your interest rates skyrocket. Everybody's real worried about that. And if our Congress really does go insane and they shut down the government and we actually miss payments, yeah, there's a call that the office. We won't be considered very low risk anymore. Right? So we're going to invest in a whole lot of other things, which is the second thing. We either got to print money, which is inflationary, or we got to make everything worth less. Or we got to just tax it, right? One way or the other, we got to pay our bills, okay. and we will, and we have. Okay. So I think we got to continue doing that. Uh, both of you guys, <laughs> for people understand that kind of stuff, okay? Regardless of which part of here. Uh, okay. So anyway, so risk free, uh, and then what are we going to add to it? Obviously, you want something for what? The risk you're taking, and we call that a what? Risk premium. risk premium. Yeah. Okay. Now the market gets the market risk premium. We get our own risk premium. But yeah, you're right. So risk premium. So we'd add the risk premium. So if you think about what the market return is, okay? So the return on the market. If we think about the return on the market, let's take that. We say, okay, what's the return on the market? The return on the market equals risk free, which is the same risk free we're talking about here, right, guys? Same one. Plus the market risk premium. That makes sense? It's just simple. The market return, so we said over time the market's earned 12 to 13 percent over 30, 40 years. So 12 percent here, and risk free has been maybe four, maybe five over that same period of time, probably five, six. Guess what the risk premium has been over time for the market? That's where we got the five to seven percent. You see it, guys? Okay. Does the market risk premium the state five, six, or seven? Most people think, yeah. So really what happens when the market return changes is what? The risk free is going up or down. That makes sense? Okay. So at any point in time, for everybody the true return is the same. For everybody the expected inflation is the same, but it's different for different stocks than the risk premium. Maybe the market stays the same, right? But we're not talking about the market risk premium. We want the company's risk premium. And how will we calculate the company's risk premium? We'll take that market risk premium times what? Beta. Beta. Okay. Now we got to talk about what beta is again, right? This is what? The covariability of our return, covariance of our return, right? Returns from increases and decreases in stock value, hopefully increases, and dividends, right? The variability of our returns period to period compared to the market as a whole. If ours vary more, we have a beta of what? Higher than 1.0. Standardize the market at 1.0. Okay? And then if we have less variability, we have a beta less than 1.0. So you could say, I suppose, if your beta is 2, you're twice as risky as the market. If your beta is 0.5, you're half as risky. Okay? I just looked up target. Some of the other classes have taken a quiz. I looked up target and they're 0.83. What does that tell you about target? They have less variability than the market as a whole. So we think that equates to less risk. It's a big proxy for less risk. Or if the beta higher is 1, it's a proxy for more risk. If your beta is right at 1, what do you, you say? It's about the same. Okay? So whatever the beta is for the company, we'll put in here. And luckily, the financial services. Uh, 
sites are capitally exploited. Finite God or finite dimensional dynamics. Okay? Capitally exploited too, of course. Okay? But they use different time spans, right? Different intervals. So it might be for more or less years, and then some might be daily, weekly, monthly. That's the idea. So it, it gives you different meanings. All right? Can give you different meanings. So that's beta. Okay? I mentioned last time that I will either tell you on a quiz what the return on the market is. So I might give you that 12, or I might give you 13, or whatever, 11, something. Okay? And then, I, or, or I will give you the, re, the risk premium on the market. One or the other, I won't give you both. So you need to know what those two are, right? Obviously, the risk premium is much less than the return on the market. I'm going to give you a realistic thing, right? So be careful of that. Don't, if I give you a seven risk premium, please don't subtract the risk premium from it, right? Treat it like a return on the market. So if I give you the risk premium, what do you have to do? Add the risk free to it. Get the, the return on the market. If I give you the return on the market, what do you have to do? Subtract the risk premium, the risk free to get the risk premium. That's all. It's not a good thing. Okay. What if I don't give you uh, a return on the market? You have to come up with your own, your own estimate, which is really what you have to do. What do you think the market's going to do over time into the future for infinity, basically, right? But into the foreseeable future. By the way, when you discount something at a very high interest rate, how many years does cash flow really make much difference? Let's say you're 15 percent. Your wax 15 percent. How many years cash flow does really matter? What's one over 1.15 say raised to the 20? How much each of the dollars would see 20 years from now? Let's do that for us. Or let's pull it out there. Okay, let's say, let's say, let's say, yeah, let's say 15 percent 20 years. What's one over 1.15 raised to the 20? You already did this, didn't you? In front of the value side. So six cents? Yeah. Yeah. So 20 years from now, they're only worth six cents. How about one year from now? 86 cents, right? Which, which estimate is more important to you? Come on. Right? 86 cents on the dollar versus six cents on the dollar? How about 40 years from now? It's almost done. It's almost done. So, you know, you make your estimates and you assume to infinity, but really what matters is what's going to happen in more recent years, of course. Right, guys? Okay, that makes sense? Yeah, uh, speaking of more recent years, Dr. Bauer had issues with like a lot more shorter term, like bond later. Yeah, like, what, 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 what Bauer's yeah. doing there, and uh, you had Brad be the same thing. Uh, what, what they're saying is, well, it's your, they say your investment time horizon. Yeah, how long yeah, I yeah, hold it. And I would agree with that if the investment ends at the end. Yeah. So let's say, and a lot of times those examples are that way. You're going to invest the money for five years, and at the end of the five years, you liquidate everything. Well, there are no cash flows after that. Okay. So there's only five years of cash flows. So that you, if you only got a five year project, right, you put the money in and then you're going to liquidate at the end, mm -hmm. yeah, you want to use a five year treasury zone. That makes sense? Yeah. So if it's a company's project that's only going to last for five years, a new product they're going to put out, they're going to run it for five years and then they're going to stop? Absolutely. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to match your investment horizon with the rate you use. So if it's real short, you use a short term rate. But my view is if you're going to invest in stocks, you're buying all the dividends and the appreciation forever. And then when you sell it, you sell all the dividends and appreciation forever. Does that make sense? It's just that those expected dividends and expected appreciation is changing over time. That's why stock values are changing. Right? Think about for Microsoft the, the day they started. What, what did they expect their future cash flow to be? And what did they turn out to be? So you see why the values are talking about and kept going. But when there was antitrust activity against them because they thought they were reporting less earnings than they really had, they got in trouble. No kidding. I can see the MBA program on it, so it's not. Right? But they, they made their statement look worse than they really were. And they weren't really trying to smooth. They just, I think they almost didn't believe they could be making that much. And they were trying to save it for later years, which is kind of smoothing, right? And taking reserves. At least that's what they were accused of. But the bottom fell out of the stock price for a while. Why? Because people didn't expect the same cash flows. And then when all that got resolved, what happened? They're off again. Right? Okay, so it depends on you're bringing new products or something. Although Microsoft hasn't been doing as well as Apple lately, huh? And everybody thought Apple was going to go broke and cease to exist. 
came in all different directions. Now we wanted to almost all of us carry one around, huh? Well, we all use Microsoft stuff too. We are. Yeah, I don't know. I guess we're not right now. No, this is Microsoft. I don't think. We're using Windows. Yeah, we're using Windows, yeah, so we still use Microsoft then. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. All right. So everybody got the idea of what these things are? Are we good? Okay. All right, so let's try the problem. Uh, let's see. I think that, that was everything, wasn't it? If, if, you not, if you have CAP M, if you have CAP M, you can plug it in here. You can calculate. So you, you take your weight times your cost in both cases, right? Weight of the debt times the cost of the debt. You can take the weight of the equity times the cost of the equity. Add the two together, you got WAC. Now you can divide it into the estimated cash flows that you're on your way. Everybody good? So let's do the problem. What do you know after this problem? I know the book guy could put it on stuff. Okay. What do you want to do first? Maybe estimated cash flows? I could care less. Let's do estimated cash flows. What is it? And then we're going to divide that by the wax. So we'll do the wax. Estimated cash flows, what do you want to do? What do you have to calculate first in this little problem I gave you? Yeah, and I guess you can assume all the expenses are going to continue into the future and all and all the revenue is going to continue into the future. So what would you do? Take your sales plus all the expenses? Except the tax. Okay. So what's that? Revenues are 140000 Everybody agree? Would you include the depreciation? Yeah. Depreciation is deductible for tax purposes. Get it out of there. Okay? So take your sales, less your depreciation expense, less your interest expense. Leave alone the tax for now. Right? And take all the other expenses, which is 75. That makes sense? What is your normal net income before tax in this case? Normal operating income before tax. That was 24000 Okay. And then what we want to do is we want to take it times one minus the tax rate. Now on this one, it looks kind of funny because that's just going to be the tax, isn't it? But in when you're doing a real company, what's the deal? That operating income might not be the same as their tax taxable income. Does that make sense? When you figure out what the normal operating income is that you think is going to happen out in the future, you're going to have to take it times one minus the tax rate. Why? Because the taxes in the current year aren't based on that income. They're based on whatever the taxable income was that year. Does that make sense? So you're changing these estimates around. So you've got to take it back to what minus the tax rate. Also, your tax rate has to be the normal tax rate. If this particular year has a real high tax rate or a real low tax rate, and you don't think that's going to continue in the future, what would you use? The real one. The one you think is going to happen year after year after year after year. That makes sense? You want normal here. Okay. So how would you get your tax rate? Let's calculate that. How do you think you'd get your tax rate? We need it. Yeah. I think it'd just be the tax expense, which is 9000 divided by the income before tax. Net income before tax. Huh? And we just said that was 24000 So what's the tax rate? 9 divided by 24. 37.5. Cool. So this is 0.375. Everybody got it? And I'm going to use the same one, right, here and wherever. And calculate my money. Where else do you use tax rate? Where do I get a tax rate? All right, so in our case here, what do we have so far? That's really just 13,000, right? When you, when you make that calculation, of course, it's going to be the 24 less the 9, right? So what we've got is 1 minus 0.375, okay? So 0.625 times 20, 24,000, what do you get? 13,000. Everybody agree? In this case, that's my net income. On some companies, that'll be true. On others, it will not be true. Everybody got it? 
If it says revenues that you don't think are going to continue, it's different. There are expenses you don't think are going to continue, or they're going to go be higher or something. You know, it's different. Everybody got the idea of this? Yeah. Um, so if you're looking at income statement, which operating income would you use? Would you use the one? I would look at all the revenues and all the expenses, all the gains and all the losses, and decide which ones are continuing into the future. And I would get an estimate of what I think income before tax is normally going to be. Okay. What's the normal year? If this is not a normal year, I'm going to figure out what one is. If this year was normal, I'm going to use that, which should just be taxable income, then I guess. It's normal, right? Income before income tax. Yeah. And then is the tax normal, right? What if the tax isn't normal? Well, then I calculate what the normal tax is. Okay. That's it. Yes. Oh, it's 15. 24 less 9 is 15. Thank you. I knew I should get something up when I saw two hands. That would be bad. Okay, 15 pounds. That's what math feels. Okay, and then what do you want to add to that, guys? Depreciation and amortization. I think we just gave you depreciation, right? And it's the expense. By the way, where will you find that depreciation and amortization expense? And this problem is right on the sheet of paper, but in real life, where is it? No, it's not in the income statement typically. Isn't that awful? They'll bury it. Because some of it might be in cost of goods sold, because if you're producing a product, what do you do with some of the depreciation? On the manufacturing plant, where does it go? Manufacturing equipment. It goes into work in process, which then goes into finished goods, which then goes into cost of goods sold. And you can't see depreciation expense. Oh, jeez. Even if it's just all, they only have operating expenses, they're a service business, right? So they only have operating expenses, they don't have cost of goods sold. It'll still be buried in a whole bunch of different accounts almost always. Sometimes it'll be there, right? But a lot of times not. I don't know. But it's always someplace. Come on, you guys. You know this. Where can you always find depreciation expense? Not on the balance sheet. You'll see accumulated depreciation. On the balance sheet, you'll show beginning accumulated depreciation in any, right? If you take all the statements, when it's valued, when it says no. If you have beginning depreciation and ending depreciation on the balance sheet, you can take the difference. That'd be depreciation expense, right? Wrong. That increase, if there's no retirement of assets, the increase in accumulated depreciation, right, is depreciation expense. What is your retired sum? What do you do when you retire depreciable asset? Personally, I have debit accumulated depreciation. So do you, don't you? Ah, so you can't just take the change in accumulated depreciation either. Most companies are retiring some assets during the change. So what's the safe way to go, guys? To say cash flow statement. What do we do on a cash flow statement under us? Cash flow from operations, determine what it is. We add back to depreciation and amortization. In fact, it's really cool. They put the two of them together for you. It's all in one place, just like this. Rarely are they on any sort of line, so you could want the cash flow statement. On the income statement, they're all over the place. And very You like that? So you can always find it, so you get the cash flow statement. Pick it up. Okay? All right. So good. So that's, we're going to get depreciation and amortization. And, we, and when we, then when we add all that stuff together, what do we have? What was depreciation amortization here? Or depreciation 35. 35. And by the way, we're using all the current year, of course. Right, guys? Why did I give you the prior year stuff? Well, if you're going to make an estimate of the tax rate, you might want to use both years. I didn't do that here. I probably should. Right? Better look at what the tax rate was last year. Make sure it's 37 and a half normal. Okay, we'll do that. When you look at, when you look at public accounting, you've got three years. Right? And then what else might you want to do? balance sheet information to get my average interest rate, I might want to use the beginning liabilities plus the ending liabilities that I have too to my average liabilities. Okay, so what's 15 and 35? 50. So I got 50. That's what we got. Okay? Not a big deal. This can go really quick. Okay, let's do wax. Second. Cost of debt. What's that going to be? You said it's interest times one minus the tax rate. Does anybody know what the tax rate is? Okay, so a little example is 0.375. Okay, 
Okay. And what's our interest rate? How would you do to get in? You might look at the notes of the financial statements on debt and estimate approximately what the interest rate is. That's one way. Then they tell you in your finance class what you do is you look at your company's bond rating and whatever the interest rate is for that bond rating, that's what you use. Huh. Right. Different ways you can come up with it. I think if you're expanding the business, that's a good way to go because you're going to be borrowing money to expand. I think if it's an existing business and you're valuing it, I think it makes more sense probably to take the total interest expense and divide it by the average debt. Because you've got a whole bunch of debt that is at no interest. Accounts payable? In a lot of companies, it's big. Crude liabilities? A lot of companies, it's big. How much interest do you pay on that? Yeah. A lot of industry bonds, great stuff. Okay? So you might want to include that. An alternative is you could just use interest-bearing debt. If you just use interest-bearing debt, you could use the interest rate on that, right? But if you're going to do that, also only use interest-bearing debt when you do your weight. Keep it constant. If I'm going to use the interest rate on interest-bearing debt only, then only use the interest-bearing debt. And what I've done is I leave off the... Uh, I leave off the long, I leave off the current liabilities, which effectively leaves off the current assets and current liabilities. Because when I add together my liabilities and my equity, I get a much smaller number. Don't I? I think my assets are less by the amount of the current liability. So I assume current assets and current liabilities basically got that. You can do it that way. Most companies, the value comes up pretty close to the way. Okay, so but you can try that. So what I'd suggest for now, though, is let's just use all the debt and let's base our interest rate on all the debt. So how do you want to get your interest rate? What do you want to do, guys? Interest expense over average liabilities. I think the average liabilities is safer only because the debt might change dramatically. Okay? It might go way up or way down. So what was the interest expense? Nine and six. Six. Six thousand. Okay. Six thousand. And then what was the beginning debt? Liability is 90, and the ending, 100. So the mean is the average of those two, rather, 95. Divide 95 into 6,000, what do you get? Come on, guys. 6.3 about. Okay, so then what I'm going to do, that's before tax, right? I'm going to take my 6.3% times 1 minus 0.375, aren't you? So what's my interest rate? After tax interest rate. Is that about 4%? Come on, guys. How much? 3.9? Oh. 3.9%. So I'm going to plug in here 3.9%. All right. So if he only gave us one year, he could use the most current year? Or yeah, if I only give you one year, you use the most current year, or you could use a variety of years, a couple of years if you want. Right? On the tax, I certainly would use several years. On the interest, probably not. The interest is good enough. Oh, I see what you mean. I could use the average. Okay. Yeah. But if I have three years income statements, I probably would calculate interest pretty high. Okay. All right. So, KE, let's do KE. Let's do the next one here. That's cap M, right? Let's go, guys. What do we have in this situation? What's my risk-free? What's my beta? Right? And what's my risk-free? Those, those are what I need. So what do you think? What's risk-free? Yeah, I'd use the 30-year treasury bond. I'd certainly use the current one. So this is 4.7%. What kind of beta did I give you? Okay. Are they more or less risky than the market as a whole? More. That's all that is. Okay. And then, uh, what's the risk premium? Did I give you one in here? No. So what do we have to assume? We have to assume some sort of a return on the market, and then from that we will subtract the risk free, and that will give you my risk premium. Huh? Everybody, that makes sense? Or you could write into the formula here. Return the market minus risk free, right? Which is risk free. Either way is fine. Okay? You can, you can do that instead of writing risk, risk free. So, what do you, what do you think? 12%? Is 
Sound good? Okay, we're getting 12.0%. Risk free, we said it's 4.7%. Uh, so, what do we think the risk premium must be? 7.3%. So, what the market would return is 7.3% plus 4.7. The market would return 12. Everybody agree? Because the market's baited at 1.0. Okay? We're going to expect a little more than that. But we don't get additional return on the risk free, so you don't take the beta. You don't take that 1.2 beta times the risk free and, and give them more return on that. Why do they get more for not taking risk? Okay? All right, so what you do is you take the 1.2 beta times the 7.3%, right? So what is that, 8% or something? 8.76, and then add the 4.7 risk free because you can expect to get that too, of course. You can get your risk premium. So the risk premium here is 8.6, you say? 8.7%. 8.7%. And they're going to add the 4.7 to that. So 8.8, I guess, plus 4.7, how much is that? 19.46 or 13.46. 13. 13.46. So, yeah, you, you, you can put the decimal to everyone. Okay, 13.46%. Everybody good? So maybe 13.5. That's KE, right? Now what do we want to do? Do the weights? Okay. Right. What do I know about my market value, my assets, liabilities, and equity? What do you want to use for the equity market? Outstanding shares, plus the price per share. For equity, yeah. Okay. So how many outstanding shares do we have? Market value per share. So we look these up, right? For each company. And what do you got? 500 million? That's it. Okay, so my equity is 500 million. Okay, you should be very careful about keeping it at you know, millions or hundreds of millions or whatever they are. Be careful. Careful to keep it up on people. All right, well, that's going to be the equity. So they got 110 million book value and it's worth 500 million. Everybody got the idea? It's market value. Okay? And what are we going to do for the liabilities? Proxy for the liabilities is going to be the book value. So we use the 100. We use the year and the quotes. Okay? Most recent. So we got 600 million. Okay, let's do weights. 600 out of, divided by 600 is 100%, right, guys? Graph it. What's liability? Isn't that 6,500 million? Uh, there it is. Uh, All amounts of thousands. Oh. Yeah. Otherwise, boy, we don't have much liability. <laughs> but but sometimes that'll happen. happen. With some companies, you'll lose you. When you, if you did Microsoft or something. Yeah. Right? yeah. And it's almost all equity. So you'll have companies that are 90 some percent equity, right? And others you'll have that are only 30 percent equity. You got the idea? So be careful. Yeah. So, yeah. So I did 160 uh, and uh, 560. So what do I have? 16 and two thirds percent, 16.7 percent maybe, and 83.3. There are so many estimates in this that you can round things off, but don't get too carried away. Don't round that off to uh, 10 percent, 90 percent. <laughs> don't get carried away, okay? Be careful, hey, round. Okay. Anyway, so uh, I guess it'd be 20, 80 with the yeah, Don't do that. Okay. Don't do that. All right. Anyway, so we're going to use those. Let's plug them in. So I got 16.7% debt, right? And I have, and they have to add it to 100. Everybody agrees with that, right? Please don't give me things that don't have to 100. I really wonder about it. Okay, so what I suggest is to convert one of these two into a decimal and leave and leave the other one a percentage and do the same with the other one. And the math gets easier. You don't have to remember where to put your decimal. So you know, take 0.167 times 3.9%. What do you get? And then we're going to add it to the other side. This number doesn't mean anything, just doing the math. What's 16.7% of 3.9%? No, it's not hardly anything, is it? Careful where you put your decimal. 
less than 1%, right? So 0.167 times 3.9, what'd you get? 0 0.1. 0.65. 0.65. So let's say 0.65, that's going to be enough. Okay, and that's still a percent now, isn't it? Because I only converted one to a decimal. So then take 0.833 times 13.5%, what'd you get? It's almost all the way up there, isn't it? 12 or something. 11. What is that? 1125 11.25. Add 11.25% plus 0.65%, what do you get? That's 12, isn't it? Whack was 12.0 when we got down. It is, isn't it? Approximately 12.0. Everybody good? We got our cash flows, we got our whack. Does everybody see where we got the 12.0? I'm just adding together this factor and this factor. After taking the weights of each, right? The cost of each. Nothing to it, huh? Okay. You do this for any company. It's just not a big deal. All right. So now what do we want to do? What do we got? And now I know the, the whack is 12%, don't I? Ah, what's my estimated market value of my assets? What amount of assets, if I'm earning 12%, would give me 50000 50,000 divided by 0.12, huh? How much is that? 416 million about? Yeah. 416.7 million. Okay, what do I want to subtract from that? Estimated market value of my liabilities, what's that? We already know what it is. We did it for our weights. What did we use for our weights? 100 million. Oh, man. Okay, it gets easy once you realize what you're doing. What's my estimated market value of the equity? 316.7. It is, isn't it? Okay, how many shares I got? Divide by the outstanding shares, right? I already used those shares, didn't I? How many shares did I have? That's how I got my weight for my equity, right? How much was it? 50 million. Divide 50 million shares. Outstanding. Into 316.7, what do you get? $6.33 per share is what I think the price should be. That's my estimate of the market value. You like it? Now, I think it's only worth 6, 6, 633. What does the market think it's worth? It was 10. So the market must believe what? Either they don't like my estimate of cash flows, they don't like my estimate of beta for the company, they don't like my estimate of return on the market. You know, all these estimates are out there. But let's say they agree with everything we did on our estimate. What must they believe? They agree with every single estimate we can. The cash flows, the risk level, you know, the beta, everything, right? Risk free, the whole thing. They agree to return on. They agree with everything. What must they believe? That the cash flows are going to be what? Increase. Increase. They're going to grow. Because this is no growth, right, guys? So this is calculating the no growth. Everybody good? So if we wanted to convert it into growth, what would we do? Now what would we do? You want to turn, convert it into growth. What are you going to have to solve? Let's go the other direction. How much does the market think it's going to grow? Okay? So let's use the market's $10 and work the other direction. So let's do another slide for this. And let's go the other direction. And what do I know? Estimated cash flows. They're 50, right? 50 million. Whack is 12%. Assume they agree with this. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to subtract growth from this, right? Minus the growth, whatever that is. And that's going to give us the market's estimate of the assets. Ah, that growth is what's going to do it for us. Okay. Subtract the liabilities. 
equals the market's estimate of the equity. What's the market's estimate of the equity? We already did this. What was it? 50 million times 10, right? That was our 500 million. We already know this. Okay. Well, let's go the other direction. We're going the other way now. Right? So what's the liabilities? They're going to agree with us on that, probably. 100 million, right guys? So the market thinks the assets are worth 600 million. Everybody agree? That's what the market believes. We think they're only worth, what was it, 460? Or 416? 470? Yeah. So, you know, they think there's what? Growth to justify the rest of it. So what number, let's figure out what number we have to have here, right? What number does this have to be so that when we divide the percentage into 50 million, we get 600 million? It's easy. Take the 50 million and divide it by the 600 million. Now, what do you get? What percent is that? Certainly less than 12. 8.3%. If I earn 8.3% on the 600 million, the 600 million times 0.83, I, 0 0.083, right, 8.3%, I am going to have 50 million. So, you know, it's got to be what? Whack left growth has to be 8.3%. So what the market's saying, see if you can get this intuitively, what the market's saying is they're getting this difference. What is G here, by the way? Solve for G. Yeah, you got it. It's 12 minus 8.3, right? So it's 3.7%. The market must believe growth is 3.7%. It must, right? To justify a $10 class. Everybody see it? The 50 million that it's earning, and it's worth 600 million, what return is that? That's 8.3. So if the company should be generating 12% based on its risk level, but the market's saying 8.3, the market's not really saying 8.3. What is the market saying? Growth makes up the difference. If I get growth in cash flows of 3.7% forever, right? I don't have to have 12% return because I get 3.7 from cash flows to the way you can think about it, just intuitively. Make sense? this working for you? So I only need to earn the difference between growth and, and uh, whack. Ah, the growth is a nice thing, right? Okay, also in this problem, they, that, that was the implied growth rate down there, right? Then it says assume a 3% growth rate. How would that one work? How would a 3% growth rate work? Estimated cash flows now times one plus the growth rate. Because what I'm saying is the first year, I would really have that much more growth. And by the way, this 3.7 isn't real accurate because we really should use a formula where we increase the 50 by the growth, but you have G in both places, so it makes it more difficult. So this is fine. This is fine for the okay? So we can do that, right? But we might as well down here because we, uh, we know what the growth rate is, is 3%, right? So the estimated cash flows times one plus the growth rate over WAC minus the growth rate will give me this estimate of the market value of the assets. Got it? And then, of course, I'll subtract the liabilities, the estimated market value of the liabilities, and that will give me my estimated market value of the equity. Where it'll work great. Okay? So what are my estimated cash flows? $50 million. What's my growth rate? 3% I suggested here, right? Whatever it is, whatever you think it is. So like you could say, well, I think the cash flows are gonna grow at not 3.7, I think they're gonna grow at three. Get the idea? Or a number, 1%, 2%. But remember, it's supposed to be forever. But it can be a whole lot of growth in the early years and nothing just later, right? It's okay. All right, and you can modify this formula to do all kinds of things with it. The WAC is right, is 12.0, right guys? Minus the 3% growth rate. Everybody good? It's the same 3% here and here. Okay? So, what's 50 times 1.03? 1, 1. 51.5. Okay? That's 
That's because it's the first year. Okay? Because it's the first year. Divide it by what? 9%. Because remember, the growth is forever. That's why when we're discounting, we can just, if it's going to infinity, you can just divide by the interest rate, right? You don't have to take it times 1 over 1 plus the interest rate raises the number of periods to each one over and over and over. It's going to infinity, right? You can, you can just use, use the interest rate. Okay? Because right, it's cash flows forever. Subtract the liabilities. What are the liabilities? Oh, I'm sorry. What is that first? What's, what's 51.5 divided by 9%? 572 million. How much? 572 million. About 572 million. Okay. Subtract from that what? Liabilities. How much is that? 100 million. Ah. So what's my equity? 472. How many shares? Divided by the outstanding shares always, right? You do a few of these, it's not going to be bad at all, guys. What's 472 divided by 50? 944. So you think it should be 944 per share, not $10. Got it? Maybe that's pretty reason. Then there was one other thing I asked in here. Were you guys able to get the uh, evidence for 2010? How many of you guys did this in 2010? What did you do? I, did, I took the beginning equity and then, had, like I set it up for the account. You got and it. And the uh, net income was 15000 I think. You're used to doing this with retained earnings, but you could do it with equity, couldn't you? Yeah? So total equity, beginning? Yeah, the hundred. Ending? What kind of things can increase your equity? Net income. You can reduce it with net loss, right? I mean, that's a retained earnings. You could reduce it with a dividend, right? What else can change equity? More contributing capital or buying back treasury stock? Everybody agree with that? But what did I tell you? What did we tell you in this little problem? This started with a problem Dan used to use and then I evolved further and David developed further. Yeah. What do you think? We'd have to add the net income. What did we say it was? Did we say anything about contributed capital? There was none, right? There was no treasury stock bought back or no nothing retired. There's certainly no no we lost. So what's that number? That's all you think. Five. Yeah. Right? Because it went from hundred to hundred and ten. So what is that right? I don't know the answer, but yeah. there's five. So that was just to see if you were still an accountant, huh? When you got done with all the finance stuff, you still think like an accountant. If you can think like an accountant, that's finance first, both. Oh, wow. You're valuable. You won't get all excited about the model. You're still an accountant. But you do need to use the name. Ah, I don't believe you. these models work. They break. They work. What do you tell you about? They're trying to predict what's going to happen here, right? But do you, do you have to learn a lot about accounting in order to do this? Oh, me? Yeah, you actually do. You do it right. You got to learn a lot about the company. You got to go into their financial statements and dig in and pull things out. You got to subjectively evaluate the beta. You got to subjectively evaluate what future tax was to really do this in real life. You're going to money, right? Real money. But you start with just trying to get some numbers and looking at it and it's just a ridiculous deal. If it looks ridiculous, it's, it's way too high a price, way too low a price. You've probably done something wrong. The market's not that bad, usually. Right? And you just keep working, keep working, keep working until you, you understand what builds the price of the stock. Why is it selling for what it's selling for? What's really going on? Instead of just, oh, gee, this is the stock that's going up, you got to buy it. Why? I don't want anything to go down. I want to buy something that has gone way down. And, they were, and the market was wrong, and it's going to take off. I want to buy it at the bottom, and it's going to take off. Right. You know, for somebody to tell me, oh, gee, it's increased in value 20% every year for the last three years. Well, it might be done. <laughs> right? Maybe next year it's going down by 15. That doesn't tell me anything. I want to know where they're going, not where they've been. By the way, it's useful to know where they've been, not where they're going. Yeah, that's true. Very good. And, but that's what builds in the beta, right? Very good. So this is just a model, just a way, way to try and do it. Okay. Anyway, well, I got a few more. 
I pulled up. How many of you tried to do a company? How many of you tried to do a company? 